If you will turn in your Bibles to the first chapter, the Gospel of Mark, as we continue our study through the Word. All right, we have come to the beginning of the glorious Gospel of Jesus Christ uh, written by Mark. Now, there are four Gospels that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Three of them are known as synoptic gospels. That means that uh, they basically cover the overview of Jesus' life. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's gospel was written much later, and John kind of fills in gaps and gives us great vignettes and, and details. But John expects that you already have a working knowledge of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So we've got the gospel according to Mark and now in front of us. So who was Mark? And this gospel, what's the lens that we need to be aware of as we are viewing this gospel? Well, Mark was brought up in Jerusalem, and his mother was named Mary. She lived there in Jerusalem, and her house was a central gathering point of the apostles and of the early church. So in many ways, that we would view Mark as kind of a PK, a pastor's kid, kind of grew up right in the middle of the church. He was about 13, 14, somewhere in that range, uh, scholars estimate, when Christ was crucified. And so this was all taking place now right as he was coming of age. And, and his house as Jerusalem was the center of the church. Peter being the, uh, the lead of the apostles in that church. Mark grew up underneath the preaching and teaching ministry of Peter. And so we have this tremendous influence in Mark's life by the apostle Peter. Now, also, it is interesting to note that Mark was the nephew of Barnabas. So Barnabas, his, his uncle. Now, you remember Paul on his first missionary journey out of Antioch, how Barnabas and Paul go on that mission trip. And you'll remember that it started with Paul, Barnabas, and Mark. John Mark is on that trip. But Halfway through that trip, we see that John Mark jumps out of that mission trip and he ends up going home. We are not sure exactly why. Some think that he might have been too young. He was homesick. It got too dangerous. Maybe he didn't like the way that Paul was the lead over Barnabas, his uncle. But for whatever reasons, uh, we see that John Mark turns and goes home on that mission trip. Now, when Paul and Barnabas get back to Antioch and it's time to head back out on their second missionary journey, Paul says, let's go, Barnabas. Barnabas says, let's take John Mark. Paul says, no, we are not taking John Mark with us. Barnabas says, if he doesn't go, I don't go. Paul says, you both can go uh, someplace else. I'll take Silas and off Silas and Paul go. Uh, and John Mark and Barnabas now, they head off and they minister. So there was divisiveness and division that happened over uh, Mark leaving that missionary trip the first time through. Now, we don't really know a lot about what John Mark did after that, but what we do know is that later on he ends up in Rome and to the Christian community that was in Rome. There was a strong Christian community that was in Rome, and you'll remember that Paul, he gets arrested, and he, he is there in Caesarea. He appeals to Caesar, and he ends up in prison in Rome, exactly. That was really lame, guys. Come on. <laughs> So, uh, Paul is in prison in Rome, uh, okay, and uh, we see that who is there, but Mark is there. As Paul is writing letters, Mark becomes very valuable to him, and in fact, when Paul writes his very last letter addressed to Timothy, 2 Timothy, he talks about, uh, make sure that you send Mark to me because he is a trusted and valued servant. And so, what does that mean? It shows that Mark Mark ended up being redeemed in that relationship 
with Paul. So, number one, the gospel is about redemption. Redemption of man from sin and Christ coming and establishing his kingdom. But who is it written through? A man that experienced redemption in his own life itself. And sometimes, you know what, we can feel like we've made some mistakes. Maybe we haven't been completely faithful in ministry or in callings or in different areas of our lives. And we can feel like, you know what, I've blown it and God is done with me. But the gospel of Mark is evidence that God isn't done with you, that he's the God of restoration, he's a God of redemption, and so we see here even through the author. Now, when it comes to the gospel itself that Mark pens, this is as close to a biography as we are going to get of the life of Christ. When we think of a classic biography, this, the gospel of Mark, is the closest one. He is really going to focus not on the words and the teachings of Jesus, but the actions and the movements of Jesus. So it is a fast-paced, non-stop uh, biography of the life uh, of Christ. Another very interesting thing to note about the gospel of Mark is it's the first gospel that's written. So all the other Gospels come afterwards. Mark is the first one that lays down the Gospel uh, and pens it. Now, he pens it in about 65 AD, right after Peter dies. Many believe that it is the death of Peter that kind of spurs John Mark to sit down now and, and record the words and the teachings of all of the messages uh, that John Mark had sat underneath Peter with. But, but remember that he writes it while he is in Rome. And at this time, 65 AD, there is an emperor named Nero that is sitting upon the, uh, the throne there in, um, uh, in Rome. And we see that one of the things about Nero is that he was a bad man. There's bad men and then there's like really bad men. Well, Nero goes into that category of really bad men. And you'll remember that it was right about this time that Nero sets Rome on fire and then he turns around and blames the Christian community for the fires and then he incites persecution upon Christians uh, like never before. And it is during this time that we see that now Mark pens this gospel to the Christians that are there in Rome that are really going through it. And, and one of the chief themes that we are going to see is the way that Jesus Christ had compassion upon the needy and upon the hurting. We're going to see in the, in the actions the provision of grace to those uh, who are hurting. And that is one of the underlying messages that we are going to see here in the Gospel of Mark. So buckle up your seatbelts. So Mark is going to move us through the life uh, of, uh, of, the, of Christ uh, here in rapid succession. Now, where does he begin the Gospel? He begins it uh, right at the public ministry of Jesus Christ. So he doesn't start with the birth narratives. The other two synoptics, uh, uh, Matthew and Luke, start there. But we see that he begins uh, now at the public ministry. So if you're going to start at the public ministry, what began Jesus' public ministry? What event? That would be the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River. That was the start of his public ministry. But who baptized Jesus there in the Jordan River? John the Baptist. Good job, you guys. Okay, so you guys are on it now. So uh, John the Baptist does. So it, you, in order to really start with Jesus's baptism there, you need to start with John the Baptist to introduce uh, the one that's going to baptize Jesus into the start of his public ministry. That's where we're going to see Mark begins right with John the Baptist as an intro to the event that starts Jesus's public ministry, and then he just kicks it into gear from there. So let's jump in to Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So opening verse, the beginning of the gospel. So what is gospel? Gospel is good news. What is the good news of Jesus Christ? The good news of Jesus Christ is that our sins are forgiven, that they have been washed away, that we have been adopted into the family of God underneath the new covenant, that we have the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of us, and we are going to live forever with God in heaven. Hallelujah. Now that is the good news. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So 
Why is it the beginning of the gospel? Because that's the new covenant relationship that we have with God. So what's the beginning of the new covenant relationship? Well, when the kingdom was being offered now. Jesus was alive for 30 years, but he wasn't in public ministry yet. And so it wasn't until the gospel went forth, the good news, the invitation to enter into the kingdom of God. This is now the beginning of the gospel, the public gospel that was now going to be preached. Now notice that it says Jesus Christ, son of God. So Jesus is his first name. That's his name that was given at birth. That was the one that the angel told Mary to name him. And what does that name mean? Jesus means God saves, uh, Yahweh saves. So that was Jesus' name. Now, Christ uh, is his title. In the same way when uh, somebody becomes a doctor, we say Dr. Luke. Now, doctor isn't the name. Doctor is the title uh, with the name. So Christ is not his name. That's his title. And what Christ means is Christ is a Greek word, which is Christos, but it, it means the anointed one. In Hebrew, that same word in Hebrew is Mashiach. It's Messiah. So what Mark starts with is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, Son of God shows his deity and his intimate connection with the Father that was unique unto Jesus. So he sets the stage there. Jesus, the Messiah, full deity, fully human, and he is the Savior of the world. Now, where does he go next? He immediately goes to the scriptures to show that Jesus is going to fulfill the scriptures and that in the scriptures we see from the beginning that God has promised from Adam and Eve when they fell in the garden, God promised that there would be a savior, a redeemer that would be sent that would rescue us from our sins. The entire Old Testament, as God raised up different prophets, he continued to give more information about this Messiah, how he was going to be born, where he was going to be born, how he was going to die. And all of these details start being placed into the Old Testament and throughout the scriptures. One of the descriptions that we see is that the Messiah, God's anointed one that's going to crush the head of the enemy, before he comes, God is going to send a messenger. He's going to send a forerunner to the Messiah that is going to burst onto the scene and is going to herald the, the Messiah. Today, the nation of Israel is waiting for the Messiah to come onto the scene. But I want you to know that if tomorrow Israel said the Messiah is here, the first thing that we would do is say, where was his forerunner? Because in the scriptures, it said that when God sends his Messiah, he is going to send the forerunner. So we see that he shows us, Mark shows us, those two passages in the Old Testament that clearly tell us that before the Messiah comes, a trumpeter, a herald, a forerunner is going to come. And that was in Malachi and also in Isaiah. So what does Mark do? He immediately goes and takes those two verses and puts them in. Those are verses 2 and 3 that we are going to look at next. Verse 2, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the where? In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So this is the identification that God put into the Old Testament so that you would know when the Messiah came that he is the authentic Messiah that was sent to, from God so there wouldn't be false messiahs that were going to rise up. And so here we see that John the Baptist was fulfilling the very identification scriptures that were placed in the Old Testament and sealed long before Jesus' birth or John the Baptist's birth. Now, you have to remember something here. The nation of Israel was sitting there waiting for God to move. They were God's people in God's land. But do you know what? They hadn't had a prophet arise for, listen to this, 400 years. That's longer than we've been a nation, uh, the United States uh, of America. 400 years and no word from God. No prophet had risen in the land for over 400 years. And then suddenly, 
this man bursts onto the scene and starts baptizing people in the River Jordan. Now, the John the Baptist's ministry, when you have Jerusalem and you depart from Jerusalem, you head down into the Jordan Valley. That's where Jericho is. And Jericho is this oasis where everybody would stop and then they would head north to Galilee after departing from Jerusalem. Well, if you go not towards Galilee, but you head the other direction, you head south, that's the desert down there. That's the wilderness. That's where the Dead Sea is. That's the direction that John the Baptist went. He came out of Jerusalem, down to Jericho, and then out into the wilderness. And now he is this solitary figure out in the wilderness at the Jordan River. And he is starting to call the nation to repentance. God calls them to go out there and start telling them to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, that the Messiah is on his way. And so verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. So what a picture that we have of John the Baptist. He was the exact opposite of, of a cover of GQ. <laughs> this, this guy, he is burly and he is not dressed in, in fine linen and clothes that, that are the elite. He is just been separated from the world to be a prophet of God. And so now he is out there in the wilderness and he is preaching to anybody who will come out to him to repent and be baptized because the promised Messiah, he's on the way. And so people started to come out and they wanted to investigate this guy, this character that they heard. And, and this is the typical way it would work. It's like you're at work and you're talking to your friends and it's coming up on the weekend. You say, what are you going to be doing this weekend? And they're like, well, I don't know if you heard this or not, but there is a guy that they're saying is a prophet, a true prophet of God. And he is, the, he is out in the Jordan Valleys in the wilderness baptizing people. I'm going to go down there and check it out. And so I want you to know that, that going from Jerusalem down there is like walking from here to Pahrump. <laughs> so it's like saying, hey, you know what? There's a guy in Pahrump that, that people are saying that this is, this is the prophet. What do you say we go walk to Pahrump uh, and see if this guy is really for real? And so you're like, okay, well, have a good weekend. Let me know how that goes for you, you know? So Monday morning you come in. Did you go to Pahrump? I did. Did you see that, that guy, that prophet of God? And they're like, yes. What did you think? Unbelievable. I'm going to tell you that the Spirit of God was so thick, I've never experienced anything like it. His words had power and authority, and I found myself, hey, he invited you to be baptized, and I, I was compelled to, to enter into the waters, and he immersed me, and it came out, and I am just telling you, all I can say is that this guy is an absolute prophet. And so, next weekend, what did you find yourself doing? It's like, well... Pahrump isn't that far, you know, uh, to walk. And, and what did you do? You went to go and see now what others started to say. And what happened? You came and you saw this man, that the power and the presence of God was on like no man that has ever lived, that has ever walked on the face of the earth. Jesus said of John the Baptist, of all the men that have ever been born of women, there's not been one greater, not one mightier than John the Baptist. Uh, now you think of Moses and you think of Elijah and you think of Noah. No, John the Baptist had more power, more authority from God to be the herald uh, to his son. And so people are coming and they are seeing and word is starting to get out and everybody is just starting to flood down. Could this be that the Messiah is on the way? And this is the very thing that he started to preach. Now, one thing, they were, people were absolutely blown away by the presence and the power of God in John's ministry. But then what he was preaching to them 
was that there's coming one after me <laughs> more mightier than myself. Look at the next verse here, verse 7. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. So one thing about John's ministry is that you were just absolutely undone by the presence and the power of God. But you know what he was saying to you? I'm the warm-up act. I'm nothing compared to what is coming. The Messiah is on the way. And so when people who were coming back after having been baptized, uh, now after seeing the power of God on top of John the Baptist, but with the word that the Messiah is going to come, messianic expectation now began to percolate throughout the land. So much so that people started to flood to the Jordan River. What else happened? The religious rulers and leaders started to hear about this. Suddenly all the people are going down to see this guy who is, who is he? Some self-proclaimed guy that's out there? And remember, they go down to investigate John the Baptist at the Jordan River. And John the Baptist sees them approach and he says to him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to escape the wrath that is to come and man he goes at it with the religious leaders right from square one and so we see john's ministry there in the jordan river but what is going to happen to john he knows that he's the herald of the messiah but one day while he is baptizing the messiah is going to end up standing in line and all of a sudden, as he dunked them and he turns, there is the Messiah, the Son of God, waiting to be baptized by John the Baptist. Now, this is the very guy that John has been telling everybody that there is one that is coming that is so holy, so mighty, so amazing. I'm not even worthy to touch, to unloose his sandal. And yet, there is Jesus now. And God shows John the Baptist this is the Messiah. John didn't know who the Messiah uh, was going to be. But suddenly now Jesus is there. And in this moment now, we see that John is standing face to face uh, with the Lord. In verse 8, John is declaring, I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And so this moment, can you imagine in John the Baptist's life, as he is proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand, that he is the messenger and Jesus now stands before him. And you remember that John now says to Jesus, am I to baptize you? I'm the one that needs to be baptized by you. And Jesus says, suffer it to be so for now that all righteousness may be fulfilled. He was telling John, I am setting the example to everybody. I am leading everybody to heaven. And part of that leading them to heaven is submission and, and being baptized and repentance. And so he is fulfilling the typology for us that we are to walk in his steps. He is showing us righteousness. And so John the Baptist now takes Jesus and immerses him into the water and baptizes him. But as Jesus comes up out of the water, it was different than anybody else that he had baptized. Because look at what it says in verse 10. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So all of the people that John had dunked, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. And now Jesus comes up, the skies part, the Holy Spirit descends in a visible form on a Jesus and the voice of God affirming this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, it doesn't say it in the scriptures, but I think that's when John the Baptist fainted. <laughs> I think that's it. That's over the top. I can't take this. This is too, too much to have had the privilege and the honor in his ministry to have baptized Jesus Christ, the Messiah. No doubt 
years later when he is sitting in prison, that moment that he, that he baptized Jesus was indelibly etched forever into his mind as the pinnacle uh, moment in, in his life's ministry. So bam, there you have it, Jesus now. He's been on the earth for 30 years, but it's the start of his public ministry. And then what does Jesus do? I mean, it's the start of his ministry. So, so what does he do to begin his ministry? How does his ministry begin as he has come to set up the kingdom of God here upon this earth? We see that he is going to be compelled by the Holy Spirit to head out into the wilderness. So look at what it says, verse 12. And immediately... The Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels uh, ministered to him. Now, we can have the picture here of Jesus. You know, he just starts his ministry. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, so he just retires away from the world, you know, departs from the world to go out into this solitude and to get strengthened for his ministry. But that's not the picture at all. Here's what you have to understand contextually, that the wilderness was representative of the stronghold of the demonic realm. Now, today, one of the things that's popular in cities, if you go around, are called ghost tours. And you, at night, late at night, you go on these tours and they go around, you know, to haunted mansions and all different things. I mean, if you wanted the demonic realm in our day, who are you going to call? <laughs> Ghostbusters, you know, I mean, you go to a, a haunted house, someplace like that. In Jesus' day, when you wanted to, to, to see the demonic realm, you went out into the wilderness. That's where demonically possessed people were out there. This was the stronghold of the enemy. So what does Jesus do immediately after he is baptized and he starts his public ministry? He walks right into a road game. He goes into the, the house of the enemy and he's basically declaring, I have come to set up my kingdom and you've got no power to stop me. And for 40 days, he is out there in their territory and they are tormenting him and tempting him and, and they are at it. And Jesus is declaring, is that all you got? That's all you got? You got nothing else? I am here to set the captives free and your rule here is done. And so Jesus goes right out into that wilderness. Now, 40 days he is out there. And, and one of the parallels that we see was David and Goliath. You remember David, I mean, Goliath, Goliath, is the champion of the Philistines. And what does he do? He reviles uh, Israel and the God of Israel for 40 days. And at the end of 40 days, God said, that's enough. David goes in and wipes them out. So Jesus goes into the, uh, the demonic realm's fortress, into their home court. 40 days, he stands there, and then at the end, what does he do? He just takes Satan out. Now, Mark doesn't even record the climax to that. He never records the final three temptations by Satan and how Jesus uses the word of God to just dismiss him and to end that because to Mark, this wasn't the important thing. What he is identifying for us is that Jesus started his ministry by walking right into the stronghold of the enemy and declaring that he's come to set up his kingdom and you can't stop me. And so this is going to be an ongoing theme that we are going to see in Mark's gospel, this spiritual opposition that is absolutely defenseless against the power of God. Amen? And I want you to know that the, uh, that the enemy's power against you is absolutely helpless compared to the power of God that is in your life. The enemy can do nothing against you with the power of God. Greater is he who's in you than he who is in the world. And so here we see that, uh, that he serves notice, that his kingdom is going to be established and Satan cannot stop him. Now, in verse 14, it says, now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Mark jumps forwards a year 
from the time of Jesus' uh, baptism to the time that John is put into prison is about a year of, three, of the three years of Jesus' public ministry. So Mark hits a fast forward, jumps to this point now where John is in prison. Now John has been preaching the message of repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. But Jesus, notice that he says repent and what? Repent and? And believe, repent and believe. So he adds them to John the Baptist's uh, message. Believe. Believe in what? Believe that Jesus uh, is uh, the Messiah. So we see here that this is the offering of a Jesus and his identification of himself as the Messiah. I want you to know that he invited the people back then, 2,000 years ago, to repent and believe in Jesus. I want you to know that that same invitation is going out from Jesus for 2,000 years. That same invitation has not stopped. He is inviting every single person that does not know him to repent of their sins and to believe that he is the savior of the world, that he is the son of God. We're going to see the nation of Israel is going to reject that invitation that Jesus gives them to repent and to believe, to believe in the gospel, the good news that you can be set free from your sin. Verse 16, we see that now the beginning of Jesus' time with his disciples uh, says, and as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. So this Simon is Peter. So this is Simon Peter, or who we would know as Peter. So Peter and Andrew, they were brothers, and they were fishermen. They were the first ones called. And then we see verse 19. And when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. So we see James and John also are fishermen. They are the second group that are called. So two sets of brothers that, that we have here. And both of them are fishermen. So we've got four fishermen. We have 12 apostles. Four of them are fishermen by trade. One third of the apostles uh, were fishermen. Now, here's what's interesting. When Jesus called them, Notice uh, that what he did is that he replaced uh, their identity. He gave them a new identity. And as we close in our scriptures today, I want to draw on that for a minute. Let's look at verse 17. And it's in verse 17 that Jesus says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Now, up to that point, they had lived their lives in the world. And in the world, they had their identity, they had their citizenship in the world, and their citizenship in the world went with it, an identity. And their identity was wrapped up in the fact that they were fishermen. They were fishermen. That's how they made their living. That's what they thought about every single day when they got up. They thought about, how can we get fish out of the Sea of Galilee? How can we get them to get out of the Sea of Galilee and into our bank account? <laughs> that, that's what they did for a living. And so every single day they, they would talk. Now, they learned all about fishing. They knew where the fish went in stormy weather. They knew where they would go in calm weather. They knew when it was hot out, how deep into the waters they would go. And when the water was cool, where they would be. They knew in spring and summer and fall and winter. They knew at nighttime where to go. And they were constantly thinking about how to improve their nets, how to change their bait, how to be able to increase their ability to be able to get the fish out of the ocean and to be able to continue to increase uh, their own livelihood. And so this is what they were wrapped up in. When Jesus called them to be his disciples, he didn't say, you still are going to be fishermen, but now you're going to have me as savior in your life. He said, your old identity, that was your identity when you were in the world. But now that you're in the kingdom, if you come and follow after me, it's what a disciple is, someone who follows after, then you're going to have a new identity. And your new identity is this. You're going to become a fisher of 
men. And I want you to know that the Lord is saying that to every single one of us as well. When, when he called you, when you received Christ, when you accepted him as Lord and Savior, and he brought you into his kingdom, he now gave you a new identity. Whatever your identity was in the past, that's gone. Your new lens, the new way that you are to look at life is that you are a fisher of men. And, and you say, Pastor, how does that, how does that work? How, how am I supposed to be a, a, a fisher of men? Does that mean that I'm supposed to quit my job and, and, and now come into ministry? No, that's not what it means at all. But what it does mean is that every single one of us is called to be a fisher of men. How are we as believers supposed to be fishers of men? This is how we are supposed to be fishers of men. God has called us as believers in his kingdom to love. We are to love God, to receive the fullness of God's love in our life, and then we are to go and to love others. And as we love others, what is going to end up happening is that there is going to come a point in time in the people's lives that you know that's not saved, I want you to know something about them. Whether, whether they understand this themselves or not, they're in great pain in their life. Their life is not working. There is an emptiness that is inside of them, and, and there is a tension because they are at war with their creator in their soul. They might be getting promotions right now, and they might be living in a nice house, and, and everything might be looking good on the outside of their life, but here's what's happening. They're building their house on sand. They're building their house on sand. And sooner or later, guess what? It's going to rain in their life. It rains on everybody's life. No one gets to live a life without rainstorms. But your house is either built on the sand or it's built upon the rock. When it's built upon the rock, foundation is solid and the rain doesn't have any effect. But when you build your life on the sand without God, then what happens is when the rains come, then the foundation falls away and the house falls. And their lives fall apart. Their lives fall apart. And here's what happens. They end up turning to the person who has been loving. The person that has just been continuing to be there and just consistently loving every single person. Now God calls us to even love our enemies. To even love the people that don't like us. Even the people that are making fun of us. And, and you'll find that as you just keep on loving everybody, as you just keep on loving everybody, here's what ends up happening. One day, they're going to walk up to you and they're going to say, hey, do you have a minute? Can I talk to you for a second? And man, there's some stuff that's going on. I just wanted to see if you had any advice, if you had any counsel. And here's, and here's what happens. The Word of God tells us. They'll know that you're my disciples by the what? By the love that they have one for another. And what's going to happen is that they turn in their times of trouble, in their times of calamity, they turn to us for the answers. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we're to be ready in season and out of season. Be ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that lies within you. Now, in order to give an answer, what has to have been asked? A question. And that is the very question. And as you just are loving people, as you just love, then those moments are going to come when they are going to come to you. And this is how you are now a fisher of men. By just staying steadfast and loving everybody, you're waiting for them now to come uh, and to ask you the question. When I was growing up, I remember learning how to fish. And I lived right across the street from a pond. And I can remember being young, and, and I don't know if you remember that, but they had these bobbers that were half red and half white. They were the little tiny bobbers. You put them on your pole, and then you put a hook on it, and you would put this worm on it. And I can remember, you know, learning how to go across the street over this pond. You know, I got my hook, I got the worm on it, and threw it out there, put it in, and I stood there. And I have to tell you, this was the most boring thing I ever did in my entire life. It was hot. I was thirsty. There were mosquitoes that were flying around. And I'm like, I don't get it. This is the worst thing I've ever done in my entire life. And I'm just standing there, hot. The bobber's just sitting there in the water. You're like, 
And then all of a sudden, the bobber moved. And this became the most exciting thing I ever did in my entire life. And then the bobber went underwater and pulled and the fish comes flopping in. And, and all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, I'm fishing. Gang, I want you to know something. Loving people, just love them, is just standing there with the pole. Just keep loving them. Just keep loving them. Just keep loving everybody. And then you know what? One day, the bobber moves. <laughs> and it gets really exciting. <laughs> and your fishers of men. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, help us to be those fishers of men that you created us to be just by loving. Not by confronting, not by whacking people over the head, not by judging, just by simply loving by helping us to just keep our pole in the water. And Lord, while nothing on the surface might be happening, there's a lot going on underneath the surface. So Lord, help us to be ready in season and out to be able to give an answer for the reason of the hope that lies within us. So Father, we love you, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.